Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our community event today. Um, my name is Lizzie Brin, and I'm the president of the Junior Economic Club of Chicago. Um, just for introductions, if everyone could type their name, grade, uh, and school in the chat, and maybe why you're in, you are interested in attending today, that would be great. Um, we have people from all of our chapters here today. We have Chicago and other cities as well as high schoolers um, from the Chicago area, um, as this is one of our community events that is open to anyone. So we'd also highly encourage you to turn your camera on if you haven't already, just um, it makes for a more engaging event. So just as a quick overview of uh, the Junior Economic Club of Chicago, we were founded in 2014 and we're an entirely student-run 501c3 nonprofit that introduces high school students to business and economics through weekly uh, member engagement events like this, quarterly economic forums, and ongoing community initiatives. Our Chicago club has over 130 members from 34 high schools across the city, as well as chapters in eight other cities across four countries. So you can apply, learn more about the club or apply for admissions at junioreconomicclub.org. Um, if you are a member, today we have members and non-members. We do have a post-event member discussion afterwards, so you can chat Elp Demertis if you're interested in learning more about that, and it'll be directly after the event. Also, if you have questions throughout the event, um, so we'll have moderated Q&As, so you can privately chat any questions you have to Umer. And so um, just make sure to indicate whether you would like to ask your question live or have him ask it for you anonymously. So that pretty much um, are all of our uh, opening remarks. I'll pass it off to Umer to talk, to introduce himself and talk more about why he coordinated this event today. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Umer and I'm an ambassador for the Junior Economic Club of Chicago. And one of the main reasons why I chose this topic for this event is like ever since like I was a kid and growing up, I've always been interested in like how the stock market works, like how you choose stocks, like what goes into the process of buying, what goes into the process of when to sell and like growth stocks and stable stocks and all sorts of things like that and like judging the risk and potential. So I really hope that you guys are going to be able to get um, a great amount of knowledge from this event. And now I'm going to pass it over to uh, our guest speakers, Mr. Huey and Mrs. Blaine. Um, before we begin the presentation, if we could have Mr. Huey introduce himself first, followed by Ms. Blaine, that'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah, happy to introduce myself. Uh, we actually have a slide in that, um, in our deck kind of, of introductions. So if, uh, if it's okay, could we yeah, uh, introduce share. ourselves on that? Yeah, you can share yourself. Yeah, you can share this. You can start sharing the presentation right now. One of you two. Okay. I think you should have sharing app capabilities, yes. Just one second, I'm gonna put it in present mode. There we go. Can everyone see it? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm able to see it. Okay, um, great. Well, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, you know, we're, we're excited to kind of um, introduce ourselves and share our perspective on the exciting world of um, stock pitching um, today. And, you know, excited to answer any questions everyone may have as well. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess I'll start off with my introduction. Um, you know, uh, so I'm an equity analyst at Morningstar. Um, what that means, I cover aerospace, defense, and airline stocks. So, um, you know, I'm watching, uh, you know, what's going on with, with planes and transportation pretty closely. Uh, before that, I, um, you know, went to a liberal arts school out in Colorado. Um, and I grew up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina before that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Laporte. I am currently an equity analyst covering um, growth tech stocks, mainly in enterprise software. Um, before that, I was an associate equity analyst on the financial services team, also at Morningstar. Um, I started in September 2019, and I also went to a liberal arts college, um, but just in upstate New York.
Um, so I wanted to start off just by talking about, you know, what the being an equity analyst entails and what covering stocks is, because this is something we're going to talk about a lot. Um, what we do is we try to really understand, you know, a few narrow industries. So for me, um, it's commercial aerospace, uh, defense contractors and airlines, and so understanding what the key long term, long and short term drivers are for a particular industry and hope to know that better than, um, you know, uh, whoever else is out there investing about this. Um, we carefully read industry news, financial reports, you know, everything that we can to try to understand um, what's going on in the industry and how outside events are going to impact the industry. Um, and, uh, so then finally we will use our understanding of the industry, current news and trends to kind of forecast out the fundamentals. So this would be, you know, revenue for a company, their profit, how much cash they're generating, um, and kind of create a story for what we think is going to happen, you know, over the next five or 10 years and then try to translate that story into numbers, into growth forecasts, profit forecasts. Um, and then we'll use those forecasts to try to determine whether or not there is an investing opportunity within a stock or if maybe it's a little bit overvalued. Um, yeah, Nupur, do you have anything to, to add to that? Um, no, I think I think that covers it, it pretty well. Um, you know, I think that in terms of being able to understand a company or being able to analyze a company, um, it's really important, as Burke said, to um, understand the industry in which it is functioning um, before you can analyze the stock, because a lot of times, you know, you're comparing it to competitor companies that are within the same industry. So knowing the dynamics can be really important when you're trying to forecast um, the value of a stock um, relative to other players in the space. So I, th I think that covers it pretty well. Oh, actually, I've got one more thing to add on this. Um, you know, one thing that, um, you know, to put this in a tangible example, like, you know, obviously people have stopped flying with the pandemic, um, you know, and the driving force prior, and I'm currently pretty optimistic about the future of travel, um, you know, despite headwinds from the pandemic, um, you know, the driving force behind, um, behind commercial aerospace before the pandemic was that, you know, places in um, particularly China and also uh, India and other parts of Asia were rapidly developing and that, um, you know, that caused a lot more flights and a lot more planes to need to kind of serve that need. Um, and, um, you know, even in spite of the pandemic, I thought that, you know, Asia would still continue developing over, you know, a 10, 20 year period, which is, I thought, a much more powerful force rather than say like a couple year pandemic. So, um, you know, I was and Morningstar was therefore very optimistic during the beginning parts of the pandemic. Um, so that's, that's kind of what it means to, you know, look through the news and see which do you, th which story do you think is more powerful? Um, great. So, you know, just expanding on that a little bit, um, I think it's important to note that no two industries are the same. Um, different, it, depending on which industry you're trying to analyze, the key metrics that can kind of form your investment thesis can differ. Um, and we thought it could be helpful to use some examples on the sectors that we're covering with industrials and technology and um, just give some examples on what metrics are important in each of those industries. Um, so Burke, if you want to talk about industrials first. Yeah, so I think what investors want to see in an industrial just generally is uh, product cycling, I mean, long is a product, um, how long is a product uh, purchased for, you know, airplanes are the same airplane that uh, has was flying in the 60s and 70s is flying today pretty much. So these are very long cycle products. How healthy are the end markets? 
right now, probably not so not so healthy. Um, and I think what industrial revenue, what in, what industrial investors really want to see is just a way to be sure that, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, there's still going to be strong revenue sources. Great. Um, I guess on the technology side of things, there's um, different factors that you're looking at when you're considering whether the company is actually a good performer and a good player in the industry. Um, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, tech stocks really took off. Um, they've been some of the best performers over the last year. And some of it is, according to me, some of it is justified, some of it is not. Um, you know, I think that with the pandemic, business adoption of technology has accelerated by several years um, just because going from the office to working from home every day kind of poses its own set of challenges. And now you have to adopt new technologies in order to enable the remote work. Um, even after, according to me, even after um, we go back to a more normal world, I think that there is now a clear understanding of just how important technology is in order to support day-to-day -day functioning and in order to be able to differentiate a company from others. Um, as a result of which um, technological adoption by businesses and just individuals should um, continue to grow at a, at a healthy pace in different areas. So some factors that you look at, the first thing I have in here is bookings and product viability. So the way that cloud-based businesses kind of make money is that they charge subscriptions costs. So like if you have a Spotify account, you're paying $9.99 a month for Spotify. Um, same kind of thing. You have a subscription for um, the software that the company is selling to your business. Um, and I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of this, but basically bookings gives you an insight into how much money businesses are planning to spend with you in the future. So it kind of tells you, oh, there's a billion dollars that are going to be coming in because of my subscription model. So that's something that's helpful to look at. Um, product viability is another thing that's pretty important in that um, if you have a product that doesn't function as intended, so if you have software that says, this is security software and it's going to protect your um, computer system from viruses, but then it doesn't do that. So in that case, um, you know, this isn't necessarily a company that can be considered to be a serious player unless it fixes some of those issues. So looking at how well their product works and how essential it is to businesses is pretty important. Um, for growth tech stocks, the most important thing is how quickly can they grow their revenue? Um, because if you are a new company and you're pushing this new exciting software product out there, you want to be able to show a high rate of adoption for your products. Um, otherwise, you know, um, if, if you're growing at 5% a year and you're new and you're trying to have people um, adopt your product, that isn't necessarily something that's very encouraging to see. And then the last thing is retention rates and that our businesses, once they adopt your product, do they keep using it or are you losing business? So if you are retaining, if your retention rate is 99%, that means 99% of businesses who used your product before are still using it. So that's necessarily a retention rate greater than 90%, for instance, is seen as a good indicator. So those are just some of the differing factors between industrials and technology that you look at. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit upon what it, what are some of the few things to look out for when you are pitching a stock? Um, you know, there's four, four key areas in that um, what goes into your preparation of your slides um, and understanding the company, how, how your analysis looks, how you're able to present it, and whether you're actually presenting a clear and concise thesis and opinion. Um, so on the preparation side of things, as we mentioned, it's extremely important to understand major industry drivers and be able to understand your company's competitive positioning within an industry. Um, after you understand the industry and you understand where the company is, you should be able to use that information to um, develop a forecast that actually tells a story. So if a company, 
has been growing for 10% and you think that there will be demographic factors that are going to encourage growth for 15% in the future, then you should be able to kind of connect your story to that 15% growth numbers that you're forecasting. Um, and then just in terms of presentation, of course, it's important to note that the slide deck should be well formatted. Um, having done a few of these before, I know that um, people really, really look out for excellent presentation skills and that everything is in um, a consistent, um, well-organized manner. Because if you have a slide where bullet points are not fully aligning or anything like that, while they seem like small details, they can really add up. Um, so that's kind of the preparation side of things. Then we look at the analysis side of things where you understand the industry and the company. Um, it's really important to drive that point home. In the preparation period, you're kind of just learning about the major drivers, but then in the analysis period, you really want to dig into the weeds of um, specifics that investors might want to know about the company and specifics that would drive your valuation. When you've conducted all this analysis, it's important to demonstrate the ability to um, have your own independent thesis on a company. You know, when you're reading about it, management will always have something specific to say, and they're always going to try to paint the best picture possible for your company. It's important to not um, just repeat back what somebody else is saying, but instead use all the different data sources that you had to come up with your own perspective on what the company does. Because at the end of the day, if you're pitching these stocks, you want to be able to demonstrate your own um, point of view on them. So when you get to, get to the presentation side of things, um, what's important is how you're delivering um, your presentation and how professionally you're able to do it. Um, you know, it can be a pretty daunting um, situation if you're presenting to a group of senior directors or um, other analysts. So it's, able to, it's important to be able to maintain your professionalism and be able to speak in coherent and concise ways when trying to explain what a company does. You know, um, when I first started, for instance, I had I had problems getting caught up in small details when I realized further on that really um, what people are looking for is a big picture and the ability for you to have data points that back up the big picture. Um, a lot of times when you're doing these presentations, you may get cut off by questions. It's, it's important to be able to adapt effectively from transitioning from your presentation to being able to answer questions and then going back to your original point at hand. You're not gonna know everything there is to know about a company in the time you have to prepare. And it's okay to be able to admit that um, and be able to kind of provide an alternative response or be able to research the question later and then come back with the responses okay as well. Um, and then finally, as mentioned, having your own opinion is key. A lot of people, when they start doing stock pitches, just get caught up in stating facts um, that have been presented to them. These, these facts can be found online by the person you're pitching to themselves easily. What they're really there for is your opinion on these facts and how they tie into your narrative. So making sure that you're presenting an opinion instead of just stating um, parroting facts is extremely important. Um, you know, because facts are incontrovertible. You can just find them online. This isn't really adding anything meaningful to your investment thesis, but your opinion is something that you've crafted yourself, can be challenged and disagreed with. And that's what fosters healthy debate, which is extremely important as well. Um, Burke, do you have anything to add to any of this? Um, no, I think that that was a really good, yeah, really good overview on how, what's important in pitching stocks. You know, I guess I would just say that the questions that if you're creating a stock pitch, you should really be prepared for are challenges for the premise. Um, you know, like for instance, if uh, you're pitching a stock that makes pet food, you know, pet food has actually been on a pretty crazy run recently because millennials are buying pets, uh, are buying pets during the pandemic. You know, you have to, I mean, you really have to ask yourself, like, will this continue after the pandemic? Why? What are the big factors? Like, if you can, if you can back up, you know, your premises um, and if you can really think about, you know, think about the logic behind the story that you're telling um, I think that that's, that's really important. Like, you know, it's a, it, it sounds easy to create a story, but you really have to think about the story and just, you know, and, and yeah, and work with that. Uh, 
Um, and so just a little bit on, you know, identifying undervalued stocks. Uh, an undervalued stock are those that are trading at a discount to their intrinsic value. Um, at Morningstar, we try to figure out the, uh, the intrinsic value from forecasting the fundamentals. If the fundamentals paint a, uh, paint a stock price that is materially above, um, materially above where it's currently trading, maybe there's an opportunity, you know, um, but it depends from industry to industry. Uh, so like what we were talking about with pet food or just food in general, these are companies where you can really have a little bit of a, a, a good understanding of, you know, what's going on and whether or not your opinion, whether or not uh, something is going to happen in a particular way. Um, and it, they don't, they don't move around that much. People, people need to eat period. Um, you can have a discount to your intrinsic value of maybe 10, 15% and think that you've got maybe an investment opportunity or something that is being missed. This is incredibly different from something like an airline right now, where the entire business model was turned upside down over the course of a month. Uh, to be comfortable buying an airline, uh, buying an airline stock right now, because there is so big of a differentiation in you know, what could happen on one end of the pandemic and what could happen on the other end of the pandemic um, and how much money they're gonna lose in between. You need to have a really, really big discount to whatever your intrinsic value is to start thinking that there's an opportunity. And by a really big discount, I mean, it should be trading at roughly, you know, 70 to somewhere between half and 70% of what your targeted, what your targeted price is before you can start feeling comfortable. You need to have a bigger margin of safety for companies where there's a lot more uncertainty in what's going on. Is, is I guess the point that I'm trying to get to, um, you know, and fundamental analysis is just what, like what Nippur was talking about with um, the, you know, forecasting out that story and really understanding that what we use to identify that, to turn a narrative into numbers is a discounted cash flow model. And so what we do is we try to forecast out these things and then discount each cash flow to, you, we try to forecast out cash flow that investors could have and then discount that back to the present using a, a discount rate. But, you know, there's also other ways of doing this. One shorthand of looking at a discounted cash flow would be a, um, a, a multiple, which is just saying that the price of the stock is perhaps um, a certain multiple of earnings. Um, or, or something along that, uh, something along those lines. Um, you know, these, these can be pretty helpful for, for identifying that, but there's, uh, there's other ways of doing things. Um, and so we, we focus on long-term long -term analysis. Um, yeah, I think, Nipur, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Um, no, I, I, th I think you covered everything pretty well. Um, we can move on to the next one. Um, great, great stuff. Just one second. So this one is mainly discussing a basic guide to evaluation. Um, you know, kind of different factors that you have to look for when you are um, conducting a discounted cash flow um, and just some key metrics that people are going to ask about. Um, these, the, the core metrics are revenue, operating income, um, taxes, um, you know, what reinvestments are required in the company. And then it's always important to think about what is the probability of the firm failing? Because, you know, especially during COVID-19 pandemic times, um, that can, that, that was a question that was on many, many investors' minds in, in a lot of different industries, maybe not tech, but some of the other industries. Um, so we have a little graphic that kind of, um, you know, helps helps form that helps form that thesis as well so um 
when you're thinking about revenue and you're trying to form an opinion, you have to kind of think about whether the structure that you're using to form this um, revenue point of view, is this, is this based on your evaluation of firm specific metrics or is this based on your view of key demographic and key industry trends instead? Um, you know, for instance, if you're trying to think about where a company's revenue growth is going to go in the next five years, is this based on my thoughts on the demographics of a specific industry? Um, kind of just going back to the pet food example, where are you basing your forecast on um, millennials buying more pets and demographic shifts in that sense? Or are you basing your forecast on, say, the company selling new pet food products that are going to kind of support the top line. And of course, it can be a combination of the two as well. The next factor is operating income, which is also known as earnings before interest and taxes. So this is you have your revenue, you spend a certain amount of money in developing your product, and then you had a bunch of operating expenses like advertising costs or marketing costs and paying your employees salaries. So after all of that, um, what are you really left with after spending your money? Do you Are you profitable? So having an opinion on a company's operating income is important important as well in that is the company becoming um, more profitable over time or are they becoming less profitable over time and you know if they are becoming um, if, if the profitability is declining where is this expense kind of coming from so those are kind of the revenue and operating income side of things um, Burke do you want to talk about the next three points yeah absolutely um, so you know, the third point uh, is taxes. Uh, if you think the tax rate for a particular company is going to increase, decrease materially over the next few years, you know, that could be a value driver for a, uh, a D model. Um, for instance, at least in my coverage, uh, there's, you know, potentially some issues going on with the way that these companies, uh, you know, used to book research development expenses and now you know, they might actually have to pay a little bit more tax in, in the future. Um, you know, a fourth point of something that you can that you can create an investment thesis on is the required reinvestment in the company. You know, maybe a company, uh, I suppose this is probably more important for industrials and more kind of physical asset companies. Um, but, you know, if you build out your factory and you don't need to, um, you don't need to build any more factories, uh, you can reap all the cash flow from a particular uh, from a particular project without necessarily needing to have those one-time costs anymore. Uh, anymore. And, um, you know, I think that um, another factor would be the probability of firm failure. Uh, this is always something that you should consider when consider when creating a stock pitch. Uh, for certain companies, it's it's high and for certain companies it's low. You know, I like to think about this as, you know, what kind of exposure to a shock there is. Um, you know, for instance, uh, within the airline space, I can tell you that almost all of the airlines, all the US airlines would have gone bankrupt if it weren't for the, uh, you know, the payroll support and also the, the Fed really op uh, making sure that debt markets and capital markets were functioning were functioning profitably because once um once re once tr passenger traffic stops um you know airlines have all these expenses and and nothing to cover them with um you know i'd say that the thing that for most companies you really want to focus on is revenue that's going to be the big value driver for most stock pages but, you know, the point of this is that you don't necessarily need to have a differentiated opinion on revenue. You can say that it's going to get much more profitable or much less profitable, or, you know, maybe that there's so much less reinvestment in the company that all the cash flow can go directly to investors rather than, you know, uh, maintaining factories or, or whatever. Um, these are all, these are the, the five or six big things that, um, that you should be considering when creating a stock pitch, um, because ultimately all the questions that all the questions that you get are going to relate to one of these one of these points. Okay. 
just a moment. There we go. Um, so we had a few resources that, I mean, we found useful, just understanding how to value companies, understanding industries um, that we wanted to share and some resources that, um, you know, MorningStar themselves have put out. Um, so if, if you have access to this presentation, you know, um, I, would, I would recommend, and, and you're interested in further exploring the world of stock picking, um, we would recommend some of, some of these books. I've, I've, read, I've read most of these. Um, I, would definitely, I would definitely recommend this as a good first step when thinking about how to analyze companies. Um, you know, so in case you want um, stock pitches and stock picking to be your future, um, we kind of wanted to touch upon how to build a career towards um, equity research and just doing that um, before getting into the recruiting and internship phase of things having an understanding of what the stock market really is and, um, you know, being able to accurately um, I guess, um, develop at least a simulated or an actual investment portfolio. I know there's websites that allows you that allow you to create simulated portfolios without actually putting any real money in. And then you can track the performance of that. And I think that that's a good way of kind of analyzing your stock picking abilities and um, developing on them even more. Or, you know, as time goes on, um, you hit college, you can also create your own actual investment portfolios after getting some practice doing these simulated portfolios. Um, our My school had a finance and consulting club in which we actually also developed our own portfolios and discussed the thought process behind adding and removing certain companies from the list. And I found that extremely helpful in terms of understanding um, the world of stock picking and um, factors that you had to look into when um, deciding which stocks to um, pitch as undervalued versus overvalued. Um, of course, other things that would help you is majoring in courses that would help you kind of build the um, necessary skills and knowledge to succeed in the role. So courses in economics and finance. Um, Networking is something that's extremely important in the financial field in general. Um, you know, making a LinkedIn account and reaching out to um, professionals in the field and in the companies that you're interested in and just talking to them about their experiences and developing a network of finance professionals can be extremely helpful. Um, this one's pretty obvious, but you know, um, doing internships in the field. And I think networking can kind of feed into that where if you have relationships with people in certain industries and companies that you want to work at, it can kind of help you, um, you know, garner internships in that area. Um, the, the field of stock picking and finance is really wide. So I think the internships can also help you kind of determine what aspect of stocks or financial services you want to work in. Um, and then this also helps you identify industries of interest, you know, for me covering tech stocks um, and for Burke covering aerospace and defense. Um, so that can kind of also, once you under, understand what industries you are interested in, having a curated path to them and being able to understand those sectors can also help you. And then um, finally, this is more equity research specific. There is a designation called the CFA or the Chartered Financial Analyst. Um, if um, this is seen as a hallmark in um, having the ability to accurately pick stocks and manage a portfolio and having the CFA desig designation is something that's looked upon favorably in the industry as well. Um, Burke, do you have anything to add to this? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I think that's a pretty good overview. Um, you know, it's not, I, I guess I, at least in my experience, it was uh, kind of more stumbling around before I realized I wanted to be in equity research. Um, when I graduated in 2016, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I got, went to a development program um, within Morningstar and then from there kind of realized that I was interested in the stock market and stock picking. And then after, only after that was, uh, did I kind of like m pursue the CFA designation and all that. Um, you know, I have friends who, um, you know, maybe pursued uh, degrees in things like chemistry or things in, um, you know, other fields. So that, you know, this is definitely the traditional the traditional way of building a path towards equity research. But I guess I just want to say that this isn't like 
the only way um you know but yeah yeah i think i think that's a great point as well um if you knew right now that this is something that you wanted to do, this would be a more straightforward path to getting there. But um, I think Burke makes a great point in that this isn't the only way in that um, if you're an English, ma I, we actually had an English major associate in our department for a while. If you're an English major and you're interested in learning more about the world of stocks and you realize that junior year of college, it's still possible to get there. But um, I suppose this is more of a um, traditional path towards um, getting a job in the field. Um, yeah, but I think that's the end of our presentation. I know um, you wanted to do a Q&A session, so I'm super happy to answer any questions that you all have. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for your presentation. I definitely learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience learned a lot as well. Um, for the audience, we'll now begin the Q&A session. So if you would like to ask questions to our guest speakers, feel free to directly um, send them to me through Zoom and let me know whether you would like to ask the question live or whether you would want me to ask them for you. All right, so let's wait a few seconds. All right, so our first question is, what did you learn? Um, what are some techniques? What are some of the techniques that you've learned about pitching stock? Like what are some tips that you'd be able to give on that? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, a lot of it comes with experience. I think some of the, some of the techniques, I think some of the stuff we mentioned, being able to craft a story when you're pitching something is some of the, is one of the most important things that you can do. Because at the end of the day, the investor that you're pitching to isn't going to remember, oh, revenue grew 15% for the last five years and then 12% next year and then 14% the year after. Um, these kinds of numbers don't necessarily stick when you're trying to, um, make a pitch what's important is you have a narrative that supports that so once again going back to pet food um revenue grew 15 percent last year and this was because of millennials adopting more pets due to the pandemic next year we think it'll be 12 percent because the world will be going back more to normal so um rate of adoptions might slow down so being able to put a narrative behind the numbers that you're putting forward is something that i learned that was extremely important and being able to condense your thesis into a few bullet points versus um a really really long detailed story which is something that i had struggled with when i first started is is extremely important as well just hitting upon the key important points um i don't know burke if you have anything else to add to that yeah, I guess I just I'd also add just when you're building out the story, um, assume that the person you're going to talk to is going to be pretty skeptical of what you're saying. Um, you know, particularly when dealing with investors, when you know there's when there's money on the line, you know, people want to be really sure that the story that you're painting makes sense. So, um, you know, think about what a skeptical person might use to try to poke a hole in your argument to see. Uh, and then consider whether or not you've got a good counter argument for that, or maybe that's a risk that you should just recognize that, you know, maybe this is, it's, unfor it's unforecastable whether or not some negative thing is going to happen uh, and if this would impact the, the industry. Um, so I guess, yeah, when creating a story, just assume that the person that um, you're talking to is, is skeptical of your arguments and try to understand what they would be skeptical of and why. All right, that was a great answer. Our next question is from Pranet, who said he would like to ask this question live. So Pranet, you can unmute and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, I was curious about whether the recent influx of retail investors has impacted your analysis of stocks near term or long term. And if so, how? Yeah, so that's a what we do at Morningstar is a, um, we forecast out the fundamentals. So really the way we see it, it doesn't matter wh whether a stock is trading at, you know, $5 or $50. What matters to us is what it's worth and the difference between that and what our forecasts say that it is. Because really what we're saying is that cash is what drives the value of a firm not whatever it's trading at. Um, you know, I would, I'd say that you can only have an investment thesis that's based on, you know, 
how people are a particular thing and how people are thinking about a particular thing. But that's a totally different way of, um, of thinking about stocks than, you know, what a fundamental driven investor, investor would do. So, um, you know, not saying that that's the incorrect way to think about it. It's just not the way that, that at least I or Nippur, we professionally work, look at these, look at these companies. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that, you know, um, I've seen the, the increased interest in some specific stocks by retail investors. But as Burke said, at the end of the day, if nothing fundamentally about the company has changed, then just because there is increased interest by certain investors does not necessarily impact our long-term thesis of the company. Um, you know, let's just use the example of GameStop. Um, huge interest. Um, stock has been spiking, but technically nothing fundamental about the company has changed, right? So it's still a brick and mortar retailer in an era where something like Steam is um, taking over. Um, nothing about the company has changed. So just because there's increased interest that's driving its stock price to $300 wouldn't technically change what we think is going to happen to the company long term. It's extremely important to separate your thoughts on the, as Burke said, on the fundamentals of the company versus just market activity when you're conducting fundamental analysis. All right. Um, our next question is, um, what are specific websites that you can use to scan for like undervalued stocks or stocks that you would like to invest in? One website I like to look at, you know, just every day is finviz, F-I-N-V-I-Z dot com. And that shows, um, you know, the S&P 500 in uh, the form of various boxes that shows whether they go, whether a particular stock is going up or down or whatever. And it helps me keep track of things. You know, one thing that you might do to look for undervalued, but to look for undervalued stocks would first be under, you know, pick an industry, any industry, something that interests you and understand it. And then look at, you know, multiples, maybe like free cash flow yield, uh, maybe price earnings, maybe dividend yield of the different companies within them and try to understand, you know, maybe if there's been a divergence from their historical norms, if that's an under, if that's an investable moment, um, you know, I think it's difficult to just quantitatively scan for an undervalued stock because, you know, maybe a company like, I don't know, Ford trades at like five times earnings and Tesla trades at a thousand times earnings, um, but they're different. They're they're different companies and. You know, just because Ford trades at five times earnings and Tesla trades at 55,000 times earnings, I don't even know what the number is, doesn't mean that Ford's undervalued and Tesla's overvalued. You, you have to understand, you have to understand the companies and you have to understand why the multiple, the multiple is a shorthand for evaluation. You know, it is not evaluation in and of itself. All right, so our next question is um, for beginners. So what is the best way to start learning and getting into stocks other than joining clubs? Um, I would say reading the news is something that's extremely helpful in terms of, um, I read the Wall Street Journal every day to kind of follow what's going on in the markets. Um, other news sources like The Economist can be extremely helpful in understanding what's going on in the world, what's going on in the markets, what the thoughts of some market leading experts are. Um, so, you know, I would definitely say that familiarizing myself with news sources helped me a lot. Um, one thing I remember is being extremely confused by financial terminology when I first um, started looking into this. Um, like, I just remember thinking, what is an equity and just different factors like that. So what really helped me was, um, reading guides that were basically targeted at explaining financial concepts to you. So this one guide that I read in college um, that helped me a lot in terms of understanding all these different factors is the um, Walt Guide to Financial Interviews, Walt as in V-A-U-L-T, um, that really 
defined a lot of things for me that I didn't understand and kind of told me how to look at stocks. Um, and that, that kind of supplemented my news reading and kind of helped me um, learn more about the stock market today. All right, so our next question is, are there any online courses or like leaning, learning resources that you would recommend in order to like better learn stocks, like a course, I guess? I know that LinkedIn Learning offers um, classes. I don't know um, how much they cost, but I know that LinkedIn Learning has some resources. I know that, um, I know, I'm trying to think where else. I know Coursera offers some courses and I know that some of those um, are also are free. Um, those can be helpful. I think heading to YouTube is always um, a good idea because you can access a lot of really useful video resources for free. So th those are just some of the areas that I would I would look at. Yeah, I, I would say the first book on the recommended resources, uh, Narrative and Numbers by uh, Aswath Damodaran is probably the best book I've ever read on investing. And so I'd recommend that um, very much. And, um, you know, I think that if, you know, perhaps in college, uh, this becomes some of interest to you, I'd say the CFA charter is probably the, um, probably the gold standard for equity research. Um, so, you know, if I were a course, I would focus more on that rather than on, you know, something like Coursera or whatever. All right, so our next question is, um, what is your opinion on stock analysis methods such as um, DCF and discounted discount models for like short-term trading or holding stocks for less than a month? I think that building out a DCF takes a lot of time, effort, and you have to understand a lot about the company. And usually those are targeted at understanding the long-term intrinsic value of a company. Stocks might not necessarily move to where you expect this long-term intrinsic value to be over the course of a month. Um, so if you're, for me at least, if I'm trying to hold a stock for a month, I wouldn't do that. I would probably look more at some of the other stuff that we touched upon, AKA um, PE ratios, um, in that you can, so going back to Ford and Tesla, obviously Tesla would not be a good comparable for Ford, but looking at Ford, looking at other comparable companies that you could say is a competitor to Ford, checking who has lower price to earnings ratios compared to other players can sometimes pay off in the in the short term and looking at price trends and trying to form an, um, a thought on where that might go. But I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't use a DCF for holding a stock for something like a month, um, just because I think it can take longer than that to reflect the intrinsic value of a firm. Yeah, I guess I would add on just, you know, short-term trading is just a very different game than the one that we're trying to play with, build, with, uh, with the, uh, uh, ETF models. I mean, you know, if ultimate, like ultimately, the stock market is not about being right on a thesis. The stock market is about making money. And so, if you know, you if someone believes that they can better predict for the short term prices of a stock than the long term price, than the long term movements of a, and then the long term fundamentals, and thus the prices of a stock, you know, go for it. But I don't think that that's that's certainly not how I would approach it. And I think that, um, you know, th that would be a very, very, very difficult game to get an edge on because there are a lot of different, market of different uh, ways to, you know, I guess move, move prices around and, and all that. All right, so our next question is, um, do you think it is difficult to identify overvalued stocks in a bull market? Like I said, um, you know, thinking about undervalued versus overvalued, um, the way that we do it is we build out um, our discounted cash flows based on the um, based on our long-term view of the intrinsic value of a company. Um, 
let's say you are valuing the XYZ pet food company, your fair value is five dollars. Um, if the stock is trading at twelve dollars, um, and but nothing about the fundamentals of the company for me have changed, then it's trading at over twice what it's worth. So that to me indicates an overvalued stock if the, like I said, if the actual fundamentals of the company have not changed. So it's really just about comparing where it's at versus um, where it should be. Um, it, so th I guess those are some of the, some of the things that I would keep in mind. Yeah. You know, at least for my own Investing. If I stock is for value, that a higher stock, that's between it's like you know that that stock has been heavily um, but uh, it doesn't that doesn't. But the valuation is because, I mean, market valuation versus what the, uh, you know, what some people believe their, this company actually does. I don't have an opinion on this, but, you know, I do know that um, if there is isn't an really bring the stock price down to your target price. I'm not going to. I'm not going to short a stock that um, doesn't really have any anything in its way. Um, you know, I guess I. I think it it takes more than just identifying under and overvalued companies that to be a to be a successful investor. You know, what's important, I guess, is the concept of like a catalyst, something that's going to bring. This target, the stock price to your target price. What's going to get the market to um, to come to your point of view on a, on a company? I think that's really another important factor that I think was somewhat outside this analysis, but is also is something that investors should really consider. All right. So our next question is: What is your most favorite aspect about your jobs? Um. I would say um, just being able to spend time um, really digging deep into the fundamentals of an industry because, you know, you're, you pick up um, 15 to 20 stocks that are all within the same industry. And with each company that you pick up, you learn something new about a facet of an industry that you didn't know before. Um, as a result of which you really develop a very, very deep understanding of a specific um side of things so you know i'm a i'm a newer analyst so i'm currently working on this pickup process and with each company that i work on i feel like i have a much clearer understanding of what goes into being a successful enterprise software company what the landscape looks like what businesses are really looking for and i i really have been enjoying create being able to um you know, develop a really, really thorough understanding of one area versus a high level understanding of several areas. So being an analyst really, really helps you develop a degree of expertise in an area where you wouldn't necessarily have expected otherwise. Yeah, I, I'd second that. I'd say, you know, uh, really having the opportunity to become the expert in the room on a, on a particular subject is, is really, has been really valuable for me. And, you know, at least I find it very uh, intellectually stimulating uh, to be thinking about the same questions as, you know, probably uh, like uh, hundreds, hundreds if not thousands of different people uh, people in the world um, who are all kind of like actively trying to think and figure out which opinion ends up being the truth. And I guess I kind of find it exciting to uh, try to be, you know, try to have a differentiated point of view that also that ends up being that ends up being correct, you know. All right, so that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, we'd like to thank Mr. Huey and Mrs. Belaine once again for taking the time out of their days to speak with us. 
And this is Blaine. If you could stop sharing your screen real quick because we have another um, Livy. Okay, so Livy, you can share your screen now. Okay, so I think, Umer, were you going to wrap up? Then? All right, I can do it. Yeah, so um, we'd appreciate if everyone could complete our short, short survey before we leave, and I'll link it in the chat.